It's my second time at Pop PopTech. I'm very happy to be back. My first time, I talked about the differences between Pepsi and Coke, which may have been the most frivolous presentation ever in the history of PopTech. So this time, I'm going to try and be a bit more serious. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to, use, I'm going to use PowerPoint for the first time in my life. Uh, I did these slides last night. I had no idea. I was scared of PowerPoint because I once went to a corporate retreat and I, people were doing their life stories and someone got out a computer and they hit the thing and it was a picture of, they said, I, I'm from Pittsburgh, a picture of Pittsburgh. And he said, this is my family, this is my father, and then my father's an alcoholic and they had a picture of Jim Beam. <laughs> and I was so traumatized. That it, anyway, so I'm going to use, um, uh, I'm going to use PowerPoint. Um, oh, wow. How did that happen? Uh, <laughs> And I want to talk about the theme of scarcity and abundance as it applies to people. Um, and in particular, I want to use this um, term that I think was invented by the great psychometrician James Flynn um, called capitalization, which refers to the rate at which a given community capitalizes on the human potential of those in its midst. In other words, what percentage of those who are capable of achieving something actually achieve it? So I, I got thinking along these lines um, a couple years ago when I read Michael Lewis's wonderful book, uh, The Blind Side, which, as those of you who have read it, know that it's about a, a six foot five, 350 pound um, a boy named Michael Oher, who lives in the slums of East Memphis, and he's adopted by a wealthy um, white family, and uh, they turn him into this extraordinary football player. And in fact, Michael Oher is now graduating from college and he will become next year one of the highest paid football players in the land. And it's really an amazing book, but the thing that always struck me about that book was there's a moment at the very end when Michael Oher says, you know, he says, talking about all the people like him from his uh, hometown in, in East Memphis who never made it out. And he said, if all the people who could play in the NFL from my world actually played in the NFL, the National Football League, they would need to have two National Football Leagues. And to back that up, Lewis quotes from this informal study that was done by someone in the East Memphis school system who just took note of how many student athletes, these are all black kids, who were capable of playing college athletics actually went to college. In other words, all the kids who were offered a scholarship actually took up that scholarship and went to college. And the answer was one in six made it to college. Right? Now that really floored me because I would have thought that football and, and basketball that those kinds of sports in America were things that we devote so much time and attention to. And we're so sophisticated in our, in our understanding of them, and we, we're so passionate about them, we spend so much money, one would have imagined that the cap rates for, for the capitalization rates for those things would be really high, right? We would have, I would imagine, one would imagine that um, the professional sports establishment should be incredibly efficient at exploiting the available talent um, uh, in, in American cities, and they're not. As Flynn would say, one out of six means that the capitalization rates for inner city high school athletes are about 16%, right? Which is, if you think about it, an extraordinary number. Now, so that's the question, the theme of my little talk, which is um, how high are capitalization rates in general um, in America, right? I mean, and I realize that's an impossible question to answer, but um, I thought maybe we could, uh, we could look at um, a couple of examples and, um, uh, and try and figure out what the answer to that is. And, I, and the short answer to that question is that cap rates are really low. Um, they are much lower than you think they are. Um, and, and that's why I think this is such a, a worthy topic for investigation. Now, some of this comes from my new book, Outliers, which comes out in three weeks, and which I think all of you should buy in triplicate. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Some of this other stuff is just cool stuff that I failed to get into The New Yorker over the last couple of years, but collectively, I hope it makes um, sense. Um, so what I want to do is talk about three conditions that I think hold down constrained capitalization rates in the United States. Now, condition number one is the one we've just talked about, and that's the case of Michael Oher, and that's poverty. And poverty is the obvious thing that limits the exploitation of human potential. I have a friend who... Um, works in uh, the inner city of Los Angeles in South Central. And he sets up, he goes, works with one specific school in a very, very poor area. And he 
basically finds kids who are academically gifted and gets them scholarships to private schools in Los Angeles. And I was chatting with him recently and he said, you know, the problem with this particular middle school that I work with is that the high school the kids have to go to requires them to cross gang lines. And as a result, basically none of the boys can go to high school. So there we have a cap rate for that community in Los Angeles, one of the richest cities in the world, is zero, right? Because if you don't go to high school, you basically can't achieve anything in our particular society. And that's a pretty um, astonishing fact, but it's one that we're familiar with. We know all about um, uh, the effect of poverty, the constraining effect of poverty on the capitalization of human potential. So let's talk about other um, uh, conditions that constrain cap rates. Um, and this is my first ever PowerPoint slide. Do I have to get out of the way? I guess I do. I put it up, I put it up here to let you take a look at it. And what this is, is the roster of the 2007 Medicine Hat Tigers, who are a junior hockey team in Canada, the home of the world's greatest hockey players. And these, this team uh, played in the finals of the Memorial Cup. That is to say, this is one of the greatest junior hockey teams in the world. And uh, so this is the roster, and the question is, can you see what's strange about this roster? And if we had 50 minutes, I would uh, let you all look at this in some depth, but I'm going to cheat and just tell you what it is. Um, what's strange about this is the birth dates of the members of the team. Uh, February, January, March, January, December. January, January, March, April, September, October. April, January, January, August. March, May, January, May. August, January, February, February, June, April. They're all born in the first half of the year, right? Now, this isn't just true of the Medicine Hat Tigers. This is true of elite hockey teams all around the world. And the explanation is very simple, and that is that in the world of hockey, the cutoff date for eligibility in any given year is January 1st. And all around the world, hockey establishments start recruiting all-star teams when kids are about eight or nine years old, right? So you look at all the kids who are playing hockey when they're eight years old, you choose the best ones, and you pull them out, put them in specialized programs, give them extra practice time, better coaching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, when you are eight or nine years old, right, the difference in between being born in January and being born in December is enormous. So what they end up doing is choosing all the big kids, the kids born in January, thinking they're the talented ones when in fact they're not talented, they're merely big. But then what do they do with those big kids? Well, they give those big kids 10 years of specialized coaching, extra practice time, and more games until by the time they are 17 and 18, the kids who were just big in the beginning actually are the best. Right? So all around the world, this is a phenomenon that was discovered by the Canadian psychologist Roger Barnsley called the relative age effect. In absolutely every system in which hockey is played, um, a hugely disproportionate number of hockey players are born in the first half um, of the year. Now, um, you only have to look at this chart and realize what an incredible constraint on capitalization this is, right? Logic tells us there should be as many uh, great hockey players born in the second half of the year as born in the first half. But what we can see here is that basically there's almost no one born at the end of the year. Everyone's from the beginning. So common sense would say that if you simply started a second parallel hockey league, which had a cutoff date of June or July 1st and not January 1st, you should be able to develop twice as many elite hockey players. Right? So the capitalization rate for hockey players in Canada, a country, by the way, which takes hockey more seriously than any other country on the face of the earth, the cap rate for the thing that Canadians care more deeply about than anything else is 50%. Astonishingly low, right? And the constraint in this case is not poverty. The constraint in this case is the stubborn refusal on the part of the hockey establishment to acknowledge that they are very, very poor developers of talent. So this is not a poverty constraint. This is a stupidity constraint. Right? <laughs> so that's the second constraint. Now, you might wonder, by the way, what happens to all those um, potentially talented hockey players who can't play hockey, right? If you're born in December, you can't play hockey. One imagines one could say, well, maybe it's not so bad because they go into other sports, right? Well, suppose they all go and play soccer, which is, of course, the world's most popular sport. But I just wanted to show you, in case you were wondering, this is the... Uh, this is the roster of the Czechoslovakian junior soccer team. Um, and as you can see, uh, only two members were born in the second half of the year. Um, and the reason for that is that 
the hockey or the soccer establishment in the world in its infinite wisdom also has a cutoff date of January 1st. So uh, if you're born in the second half of the year, you can't play hockey and you can't play soccer, and I have no idea what you do. I think perhaps uh, you play video games or you do something else. In other words, so this is an example of uh, where uh, institutions get in the way of the development of human potential. So uh, question number three um, is, uh, constraint number three is the most important of the constraints, and this, is, um, this comes from James Flynn, who I mentioned at the beginning, who's one of my um, heroes, and um, had we uh, uh, six additional hours, I would regale you with some of the um, fabulous theories of James Flynn, um, including one in his new book, which is so genius, but I can't get into it now. Um, so Flynn got really interested in why it was that Chinese Americans, uh, Chinese American immigrants to the United States vastly outperform uh, white Americans. Why do they do so well? They come here, they don't know the language, they don't have any money, and within one generation, their kids are achieving at an extraordinary rate. And so he looked, for example, at the class of 1966, which is to say people born in um, 1948. And what he discovered is in the highest occupational rung, that is prof um, professional, managerial, technical, um, uh, the Chinese Americans had 55% of their population make that highest rung, and the same number for white Americans is 34%. That is a, that is a massive difference in, cap in capitalization between these two groups. So now why is that? Well, one very, for years, sociologists struggled with trying to explain why it is Chinese Americans do so well. And there's been a very, very um, serious and um, uh, extensive line of argument which says they're smarter, their IQs are higher. There's a British psychologist who would argue this for years, and there are many people who still believe this. But Flynn, who is the world's leading expert on IQ, very, very carefully went through the data and realized, actually, it's not true at all. In fact, if anything, Asian IQs appear to be a little tiny bit lower than white IQs. So what is it? Right? Well, what he found was two things. One is that, uh, one is that, uh, that Asian, Chinese-American immigrants to America um, with average IQs perform as well, go as far in the world, as um, white Americans with very high IQs. And the difference seems to be that a Chinese American with an IQ of 100 performs as well as, an Ameri a, a, as a white American with an IQ of 120. Um, the second thing, which is linked to the first, is that of the available pool of talent in the Chinese American community, their cap rates are way higher. Um, the cap rates for Chinese Americans um, in the professions, that is to say the percentage of people who are capable of, smart enough to be a professional, who end up being a professional, is 78%. Um, in the uh, white American community, that number is 60%. Now, why do they do so much better then if they're not, how are they able to so brilliantly capitalize on the available talent in their community? And the answer, uh, Flynn says, is because they work harder. And um, I think that's true. And I, in fact, in my book, Outliers, which I hope you all buy in triplicate, um, I spend a lot of time trying to understand um, what that means and uh, why it's so. Why do they work harder? Um, and the explanations are, um, are quite, it's quite fascinating when you dig into it. And I'll give you one little taste of that. And that is if you take um, a sense of just how deeply culturally ingrained these ideas about work are, if you take a group of, uh, Chinese American, or, um, or, even, or we can go back to China, just straight Chinese, uh, school kids, say 10-year-olds, and a group of American 10-year-olds, and you give them both a very, very difficult math problem to solve, and you time them um, and see how long they work at it before they give up. The American kids will give up after two minutes, and if you have a 15-minute long window to see, the Chinese kids will still be working at the end of the 15 minutes, right? That reflects very different attitudes about effort and persistence. And Flynn's argument, and I think he's right, is that when we look at these different rates of, of capitalization uh, 20 and 30 years later, what we're seeing is the consequence of those early ingrained cultural notions about how hard one is supposed to work at a given task. And what we have in white America, in other words, is a cultural constraint on capitalization due to the fact that we think, when faced with a hard problem, that if you can't get the answer right away, um, you should go give up. Um, now, why is this discussion of capitalization so important? Um, it is important because I think when we observe differences in how individuals succeed in the world, our initial thought is always to say, to argue, that that is the result of some kind of innate difference in ability. 
We, and when we look at the different rates um, that groups succeed, we think that that reflects some underlying innate trait in um, the characteristics of that group. And that is wrong, right? What capitalization rates say, what the capitalization argument says, is there's another explanation, and that has to do um, with poverty, with stupidity, and with culture. Um, so for example, Kenyans have dominated um, long distance running uh, for the last 30 years, to an extraordinary extent. To the, if you look at the world, the world lists in all of the distance running events, Kenyans um, occupy 75% you know, of the top 50 places. And this has prompted a whole argument about how Kenyans necessarily must be genetically superior to the rest of us when it comes to running long distance, right? That's where everyone goes. It must be the case, right? They're winning all the races. Well, capitalization suggests that there's a much simpler argument, um, explanation for that. You know, the, um, the great American marathoner Alberto Salazar has pointed out that if you go to Kenya, there are probably uh, uh, a million 12 to 17-year-old boys who run between 10 and 12 miles a day. In this country, I would be stunned if there are 5,000 boys between the age of 12 and 17 who put in that kind of mileage, right? What is the Kenyan capitalization rate for distance running? It's probably 90%. Are they missing anyone? I don't think so, right? What's our capitalization rate for distance running? Well, our capitalization rate for football the thing that we care more about, more than anything else, is 16%, right? So what's our cap rate for, for, for long distance running, which we care about scarcely at all? Well, it's probably less than 1%, right? In other words, you don't have to concoct some incredibly dubious argument about genetic superiority to come to an explanation about why Kenyans so completely dominate that particular field. Or consider um, African-American professional achievement um, in this country. You know, we cannot get rid of the notion in our public discourse that the reason African Americans don't succeed the way that white Americans do in this country is because of some inherent genetic failure on their part, right? That argument comes back and it comes back and it comes back. But think about this in terms of capitalization rates. What's the cap rate for, for a professional success among African Americans? You know, in Canada, the cap rate for hockey, the thing they care most about and spend all their time and energy thinking about is 50%, right? Well, black professional success is not something we care about at all. So how low possibly could that be? You know, Flynn points out that um, uh, by, the age, by age 45, 11% of white Americans are, white American males are either dead or dysfunctional. That's to say, incapable of, of working in some way. The same figure, for African Americans in this country is 34%. It is three times higher. He also points out that the number of, of African American ma men who are missing, that is to say, not in the army, not in prison, not showing up in the census, not showing up in the tax rolls, not showing up on Social Security, and who we only find out about when they die, the number who are missing is one million. Put those numbers together, and how low can the cap rate be? If it's more than 5%, um, I would be stunned. Now, I think that it's only when you think about the race problem in this country in this way that you start to understand it, right? And when you start to, to grasp its true significance, that we have a scarcity in, of achievement in this country, not because we have a scarcity of talent. We have a scarcity of achievement because we're squandering our talent. And that's not bad news, that's good news, because it says that this scarcity is not something we have to live with. It's something we can do something about. Thanks very much.